Welcome all. I'll just leave another uh, 30 seconds just for everyone to join and then we'll get started. Okay, fair few participants there now. Uh, thank you for joining us here for another of the uh, HydroTerra webinar series for 2021. Thank you all very much for taking the time with us today. Um, for those of you who are new to our webinars throughout this year, we'll be continuing with a series of presentations fortnightly and look uh, to share our knowledge with you all as much as possible. These will be a mixture of you know, method and theory and also uh, product focus. So be sure to be on the lookout for presentations that you may be interested in. Uh, and for today, we're looking into a bit of our learnings and knowledge around low flow uh, groundwater sampling. So today we're joined by our Managing Director of HydroTerra, Richard Campbell, who will kick us off around the uh, theory associated with low flow sampling and some considerations prior to doing so. My name is Kyle McLaren. I'm the sales manager here at HydroTerra. And Michelle, who was our webinar organizer, uh, will make sure that it all goes well and hopefully the trend of it all running smoothly continues. So thanks for joining us today, guys. Uh, as many of you may be familiar with now, the way we run these sessions is that throughout the presentation, uh, please feel free to write any questions you may have in the QA box at the top. Uh, I'll collate these and we'll also uh, allow some time at the end of the presentation for Richard and myself to answer as best we can. Uh, if we do go uh, significantly over time and can't get through them all, uh, I'll make sure to contact you with some answers and also happy to discuss with anybody after the session any of the things we speak about today. Uh, our Objective of always to generate uh, awareness of the methodologies and technologies and develop along with you uh, the knowledge of options to consider in this case when we do our low flow sampling. Educate as best we can for the appropriate adoption of technologies in your future projects uh, and understand from you your needs. Uh, I've heard a lot of tricky scenarios in the time that I've been here with my clients around groundwater sampling, uh, but the beauty of this is that there's always something new and if we can assist in providing options for your unique projects, that's something me and the team really get a kick out of. So um, a quick overview of the run sheet for today. Uh, Richard will kick us off with some uh, theoretical considerations of the low flow sampling, uh, some guidance resources and addressing challenges prior to uh, conducting. And then I'll be taking over for the remainder uh, to talk about the basic operation principles of the sampling pumps that we generally deal with here in HydroTerra uh, when doing our low flow sampling and also some considerations around each of the technologies that you may be looking at to do uh, the low flow sampling, um, as well as some frequently asked questions that I've sort of collated over the time uh, that I've been uh, dealing with uh, the clients and the groundwater sampling. Uh, what I most commonly receive uh, and looking to, you know, my thoughts on those uh, for those frequently asked questions and a bit of a discussion piece there. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Richard at this point in time. So thanks, Richard, uh, if you could please take it away. Thanks very much, Carl. So I guess the presentation today is going to draw a bit upon my previous work experience in consulting, uh, also in auditing where I had to review data collected uh, from low flow. And then uh, some of the projects that we've uh, conducted at HydroTerra where we've had to undertake low flow sampling, but in more extreme environments than would typically be under undertaken. So I think there's some valuable learnings to share there too. So, What's the actual real objective of low flow sampling? At the end of the day, we are trying to collect a groundwater sample of quality. And what does that mean? Well, it needs to be representative of the aquifer that we are trying to collect that sample from. And whilst that sounds straightforward, often we're in a hurry and low flow becomes rushed low flow, for example, and we start to compromise our samples. So a big and important part of this is to realize 
that low flow sampling does need to be taken in a patient way to make sure we are meeting the requirements and the assumptions that sit behind it. There's a really good publication, uh, which is EPA publication 669, which outlines some of the theoretical considerations and the operational considerations. That's a Victorian EPA publication. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you jot that down and have a read because it's a very good document. Uh, next slide, thanks, Kyle. So there's a few references. The first one's the one I just mentioned. There's, there's others out there and there'll be more than these, no doubt. Um, the one I typically use most is, is that first one. The, uh, if you're looking more at how to actually think of considerations around a broader hydrogeological assessment, then the second one there is useful. There's a little bit of a crossover between those two documents, but the first one is most relevant to today's discussions. If you're looking at considerations around things like um, preservation times and that sort of thing associated with the samples once collected, uh, EPA publication 441 is useful in that context. And the Geoscience Australia document is actually a pretty good document where you're looking at doing low flow sampling where you tend to have off gassing samples. So a lot of those guidance documents were developed at the time that coal seam gas industry was uh, trying to work out how to monitor their groundwater quality and a lot of the uh, contaminants of interest were gaseous and at significant depth. So as you bring those samples up to the surface, they start to off gas and then it's pretty hard, isn't it? You've got a sample that's a mixture of gas and water and it actually does, we call it FFS, but it's, it starts to bubble and you, you're at the top of a, a narrow piece of sampling tube and you're getting a mixed flow of these things. So working out what the water quality is like at depth in a scenario where the water quality is actually changing within your sampling apparatus as you bring it up a tube is challenging. So there's various methods around that that we have worked on in the past. So there's some publications that I'd suggest if you're interested, have a read. The top one is probably a must to check if you're doing low flow sampling to give yourself good context. Thanks, Kyle. On to the next one. Okay. So the principle behind low flow is that the water that's in the aquifer adjacent to your well is the water that you're sampling into your low flow equipment. Now, the reality is that that's a bit of a reach, right? It's, it's an assumption that is hard to prove. It's an assumption that uh, is fundamental to this technology. But if you think about it from a practical context, it's easier for the water to flow up the well from underneath the inlet point or down from above because there's no resistance to flow. It's not like it's passing through a sandy matrix or anything. So we need to have various lines of evidence to convince ourselves that the water we are actually sampling isn't coming from the stagnant part of the well above us. Uh, it is in fact coming from the aquifer. And so the lines of evidence that we use are monitoring the disturbance of the water level in the well as we undertake this pumping. Now we call this drawdown, right? It's drawing down the, the level of water in a well. The rate we pump affects how far we draw down the water in the well. The amount we draw it down is a function of the actual hydraulic conductivity of the aquifer itself. So hydraulic conductivity is the ability for water to pass through the aquifer. And depending on the type of aquifer, that varies quite a bit. Sands have a high hydraulic conductivity. 
clays have a low. So if you're trying to pump in a well screened in a clay for the same pumping rate as in a sand, you will see a much higher drawdown level. Auditors and the like worry about drawdown because it affects the assumptions that are behind low flow sampling. So one of the lines of evidence that uh, people look at when they're deciding whether or not the assessment work you've done is suitable is drawdown. So they like to see data on that. And that's typically collected with something like a water level meter. Or if you want to do it continuously, you can use a pressure transducer, which can be deployed down the hole. So there's a few ways to measure water level, but it's a very important uh, metric to have. The second main one is you can use water quality parameters. And so in the guidance documents, you'll find a lot of discussion around uh, stabilization of water quality parameters. The assumption here is that if you're seeing stable measurements of parameters like pH, electrical conductivity and those sorts of things, that that indicates the water that's coming in is coming in from a constant source. And if you've got that data plus the data from your water level meter, you can say, okay, that constancy of data suggests it's coming from the aquifer. And that's a really important set of data as well that you need to collect. So there's a couple of important assumptions that sit behind this. So low flow purging relies on the concept that groundwater moves horizontally through the screened interval in a bore, right? So there's an assumption that it's not mixing with that water I mentioned before from above your screen, okay? So really for this to work, we need to assume that the water within the screened interval of your well is of the same quality as the water in the aquifer itself, okay? And we need to assume that when we're pumping, because we've got the inlet of our pump placed within that screen, full, we're pumping water that's coming from the aquifer. Okay, so what are the steps we need to go through? Well, the first one is we need to lower our pump pretty gently. We don't want to make this well all turbulent. We don't want to have water from above the well screen getting pushed down into the well screen area. So we lower it slowly and carefully. And we like to place that inlet roughly in the middle of the screen. Why would we want to put it there? Well, the reality is that's the furthest point from where it might be stagnant and being affected by things like the air above the water. So within your well, if you think about it, the surface of the water in your well is exposed to the atmosphere. So there's chemical reactions going on there and there's off-gassing and that sort of thing. So concentrations of various parameters as you get nearer that air-water interface change and they're not representative of the aquifer. So you want to get your pump inlet down where it's most likely to be representative of the aquifer. Obviously, when you lower a pump down in a well, it causes some problems, right? It causes some mixing of the water above it it pushes some down. So if you're in a situation where you're doing a long-term low flow sampling program, like on a mine site, for example, or on a long-term contaminated facility, then dedicating low flow pumps, that means you leave them there for good, right, is a much better way to go than using portable ones and decontaminating them between holes not just because of the potential for you to bring contamination from one well to another, but because of that disturbance of the water, pushing that water down into your screened interval can cause errors. Um, on a practical consideration, a lot of the low flow pumps have these little ball valves in the bottom. And if you place a pump too near the bottom, you can end up with sediments getting in there and that not only causes more sediment in your sample, but it can also affect uh, the function of a lot of pumps. Most pumps don't like sediments. 
Um, next slide, thanks, Kyle. All right, so I've got a couple of factors to think about if you're planning a low flow sampling program. Well, some of these things happen well and truly before you even start sampling. And one of the big ones is drilling. How has that well been installed? Has it been developed? And what do we mean by developed? It's really removing any residual sediment that's in your well. If you come along and do low flow sampling and have the well hasn't been properly developed, then you will uh, have residual in there and that will affect your samples. It also depends on the type of well. So I've listed a few there. So there's drive points, which uh, I've got a picture of later, where you just belt them into the ground. There's multi-levels, which uh, where you have multiple screens within wells within the one location. And then you have your standard monitoring wells. And they all need to be considered because certain pumps don't work in certain types. Uh, so you need to know what you're going to be sampling from. Um, I have seen situations where people have gone to site only to discover they can't fit their pumps in the wells. Um, I've mentioned bore development, so I'll move past that. Um, before you go, you need to really know your depth for screened interval because you need to be able to lower your pump to that desired depth. You also need to be able to know for sure whether or not you've got a pump that can have the capacity to lift that water out. Uh, often Hydroterra works with really deep wells, you know, long way down. Some of the wells we've sampled have screened intervals more than a kilometre below ground surface, right? This photo we're looking at here with um, this uh, gas separator with the chap with the orange shirt, um, Alex, who used to work with us, is, um, is sampling from a well which is very deep and we've got off-gassing concerns around that. So there's all sorts of considerations as you start dealing with deeper samples. That picture of a pump, second from the left, is a uh, converted double valve pump where the bottom section of that is just a solid stainless steel weight. So the whole thing, just to give you some kind of scale, is about a metre and a half long. And that weight is heavy. It's solid stainless steel. And the idea of that is you need to overcome buoyancy effects when you're sampling from a long way below ground surface. So in this particular project, we had lots of wells where the standing water level was quite shallow, like maybe uh, less than 50 metres below ground surface. But the screened interval where we needed to collect the sample from was over a kilometre. So you had all this tubing that came down above those pumps, which caused buoyancy effects. So we couldn't get the pumps down without putting those big stainless steel spikes on the end of it. Um, contaminant type is important. You really need to know before you go what the contaminants are because there's a, a misconception about low flow sampling that it's about the pump type. It's not, it's about the pump rate. So you can use all sorts of different pumps to collect a low flow sample, as long as you can reduce the pumping rate to a slow rate. So you can use like a 12 volt electrical pump, as long as you can get the rate down far enough. But it depends a bit on the contaminant type to which pump you should select for your low flow sampling. And I have a table I'll show you in a minute, which provides a bit of guidance on that. Other decisions we need to make, right? Well, I've said the first one, pump selection. The second one is to whether or not to dedicate or do portable ones. That involves a cost analysis as well as considerations on data quality. As I said before, dedicated systems always provide better data because there's less variables. You need to work out how many, how much tubing you need, how many bottles, that sort of thing, and what sort of tubing, right? So LDPE is fine up to a certain depth, but when you're dealing with these really deep samples, the tubing flexes too much and it takes too much gas to get a sample up. You're literally creating a bigger volume as you pressurize the system. So in those instances, we use HDPE, which is a more rigid tubing. 
You need to know about your decontamination procedures and we have standard operating procedures for that. Most of the companies you work for would also have their own SOPs. Um, so I won't talk too much about that other than to say it's obviously very important that you do decontaminate. Um, sample preservation, you can put a lot of work into collecting samples, but if you aren't preserving them in the appropriate way, which uh, is in one of those references I uh, mentioned earlier, or your laboratory often tells you, then you can have significant changes in your water quality of your samples before you get them analysed. So you've got to be careful with that. Uh, so really these, these photos, I've, I've talked about a couple of those. Um, the, the one on the left though, that's that system on the top there is a gas water separator. So in that particular project, we were collecting these low flow samples, which were effervescing. And we had a chamber which partitioned the gas from the water. A water sample was collected into a bottle and a gas sample was collected into a Tedlar bag. And we did a back calculation on the concentrations um, in, in the gas to work out what the total concentrations would be in the water. Um, I will, and that's Kyle. Is that you, Kyle? That is Kyle on the right there doing some sampling. So um, Kyle can talk more about that uh, particular project. I wasn't uh, involved directly with that one. Now, next slide, please, Kyle. Okay, so in terms of monitoring wells, just to recap a little bit on some of the things I've said. Okay, so we want to have our sample coming into that well screened interval, which is that slotted section that you'll see uh, in this picture. Um, so we need to know what the depth is of that well screen before we go out, right? And that should be marked on the well construction records. Sometimes people go out and they think I'll just sample, and I've seen this, right? Uh, sample, when I hit my water, I'll go about a metre below it and that'll all be okay. Well, I've worked on systems where the inlet there is more than a kilometre, or that water level is more than a kilometre from where your slotted screen section is. So what happens in those scenarios? And I have seen projects done like this. People have gone and sampled, not from the screen in a full, done a complete sampling round and the data's been deemed not representative. It's very important to do that. Um, next thing to look at is just the actual well construction. So you'll see the sort of gravel uh, depicted of the filter pack. The filter pack's important. It's effectively part of your screen, right? The screen refers to the slots in the PVC, but when you start pumping, that filter pack is of a much higher conductivity typically than the aquifer. So water will flow from that filter pack as well. So sometimes people construct wells badly and you have a very long filter pack and that can lead to problems, particularly if that goes up above the boundary of the aquifer. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that another time, but we're gonna run out of time otherwise, so I will move on, but just a couple of practical considerations there. Uh, next slide, thanks, Kyle. This is a drive point piezometer. You would use these sorts of things, particularly in areas where it's difficult to get access for a drill rig, or if you're doing a very short term low flow sampling exercise where the depth to water is less than about sort of three meters maximum. Uh, even three meters is quite a long way down with this technology. Um, the reason I wanted to show this was you'll see the tube poking out the top of this. Well, the only way you can really sample a low flow sample from this sort of uh, drive point is using the peristaltic pump which is a, you can see it on the ground there to, um, well, to the right of that operator as he's facing us, but to the left of the image. Um, so drive points are a useful way in combination with a peristaltic pump of collecting low flow samples in shallow systems. Uh, next slide, thanks, Scott. 
Multi-levels can be used to collect low flow samples as well. Now, multi-levels are used a lot, quite a lot these days is continuous multi-channel tubing is the CMT um, and rarely used these Waterloo systems on the left. Uh, so I'll talk more about the continuous multi-channel tubing. Uh, that picture is pretty much to scale. So each one of those little uh, sections of that tube is effectively its own monitoring well and you have a well screen that's constructed into those tubes. So you can monitor from multiple aquifers from the one well by using each discrete tube to monitor a separate aquifer. You never cut two into the one, into, you never cut one tube into two aquifers because you'd be breaching and causing connectivity between those. So always cut one into that. The reason I wanted to talk about this with respect to low flow is there are these little dedicated low flow pumps that you can fit in those tubes. So you can conduct low flow sampling from these and you can set up manifolds to allow you to collect low flow samples from multiple tubes at the same time. Um, next slide, thanks Kyle. Okay, so last slide from me. This is a useful table that's in that uh, EPA publication 668. And in there, they have recommendations on sampling devices, but this also covers your low flow pumps. So you'll see down that left hand column, a number of different pump types, like you've got peristaltic pump, gas lift pumps, for example. What this, what I typically use this for is to see, is it's to give you a gut feel of how the regulator feels about such things and what sort of pumps one should be using for certain types of parameters. So you'll see across the uh, third row from the top, there's a list of parameters, and then you'll see that they have a coding for whether or not a certain device is suitable. Now, I don't agree with all of what's on here, but it gives you a snapshot of what the regulator felt quite a few years ago now, but it is good guidance and a, and a good point of uh, reference for yourselves. Now, uh, I think I better hand over to Kyle to continue forward. He's going to talk more about the specifics of various pump types and how to utilise in low flow sampling. So over to you, Kyle. Thanks for that, Richard. Yeah, it was good uh, in-depth detail there on the theories behind that. Um, I'll start some things off with a bit of a chart here. Uh, I'll start to delve a bit more into the operation principles of the most common things that we deal with and also just some considerations uh, for equipment selection when you are out in the field uh, and just some things to be wary of in my experience that I've had so far uh, with groundwater sampling. So. Um, here is a list of basically uh, the most common pumps that we deal with at Hydroterra. Uh, we can issue a copy of these slides um, to participants here today if you wish to delve a bit more into these uh, charts. Um, but the main pumps that we deal with here at Hydroterra when looking at low flow sampling is the uh, QED Sample Pro, which a, a lot of you or majority will be familiar with. Uh, great portability and ease of bladder changes. Uh, for easy decontamination and really uh, the main pump of choice in Oz for the more shallower sampling, so less than sort of 50 metres. Uh, on paper, it has some sampling uh, of up to about 70. Uh, I've found uh, in my experience, I tend to struggle uh, to get significant flow rates past the sort of 55 to 60 metre range. So it's just something to keep in mind. And uh, then we have the, the silence range of pumps uh, so the, the 407 blade and the 408 double valve, which I'm going to talk a bit more in depth in the next slides. Um, there's also the micro double valve pump uh, for those CMT systems that Richard mentioned earlier, uh, the multi-level systems, uh, and of course the peri pump, which you also spoke about. Um, the 12 volt pumps, uh, which some clients use more so on the purging method uh, of sampling, uh, but the low flow controllers that do associate with some of those pumps uh, do allow for that control being able to utilize 
uh, the low flow method. And uh, just something to consider if doing a sampling round um, where you're a bit time constrained and you need an uh, economically viable option uh, quite quick. Uh, there can, there's still some considerations with these, but I'll talk about that shortly. Um, so the 407 bladder pump, I'm just going to talk about the operation principle. Uh, and this does apply uh, with the exception of a few specification differences to the QED sample pro as well. So the principle of drawing in water from the pump intake uh, into our bladder during vent cycle and a drive cycle, which is us applying our uh, compressed gas or air, uh, allows us to compress the bladder inward to draw water up the sample line. Uh, it does prevent um, contact with air supply to the sample water, uh, and there is less fine tuning involved when wanting to select the bladder pump uh, for these operations. Uh, we have a maximum depth range on these pumps at about 150 meters in the 407 bladder pump. And again, compare this to uh, you know the QED, which is at about 60 meters in my experience. So uh, if a bladder pump is a method of choice that you may be uh, sampling uh, or so you've selected to, to do your low flow sampling, uh, if there's uh, instances where it's a bit deeper um, than the specs of the QED, uh, sample Pro, the 407 may be something to consider as well. Um, and there's the option of a drop tube assembly with these bladder pumps uh, to change the screen pump intake to deeper depths uh, while still utilizing uh, our calculated PSI pressures and driving vents for where the body of the pump is sitting. So there's also options for dedication of these pumps, which Richard did speak about earlier. Uh, the 408 double valve pump operates uh, without the use of a bladder and work on you know, the principle of applying our drive gas to the column water uh, that comes back up to equilibrium with the standing water level. So that's the main difference when we're doing our calculations between these two pumps and consideration. Uh, in the bladder pumps, both the QED and the Science 407 and basically any bladder pump, we're doing our PSI calculations based on the pump intake of where the, the pump is actually sitting. With the double valve pump, that allow, allows us more flexibility because we're doing our calculations based on the standing water level. So the operation inside that pump allows for that water to come back up the drive line into standing water level so we don't have to apply as much gas. Um, so, you know, we can say that if we have standing water levels of less than 150 metres uh, below ground level, then we can theoretically pump uh, anywhere. And in the case that Richard mentioned earlier, we have done so with these pumps to over a kilometre deep. Um, there is a bit more fine tuning process to avoid air contact with water, if that's a, something that's uh, really um, needs to occur in your site. Uh, but if the PSI drive and vent calculations are utilised, this process can be easily overcome, which is the calculations I'll talk about in just a second. Um, there isn't a need for a drop tube assembly and you can sit the pump anywhere, again, provided our standing water levels are less than 150 metres um, and also have an option to dedicate these systems to, which we have done so for numerous sites around uh, Australia with these double valve pumps. So this is just a cross comparison of the two pumps side by side and below are some quick sort of calculations when looking at our PSI drive and vent times. Uh, these are a good starting point. I have covered this a lot more in depth in detail in another webinar that I've done previously, which is directly comparing the 407 and 408. But it's really good to hit home these calculation principles because it is a very good starting point for your low flow sampling when considering and going out into the field to do so. There's a document that uh, I've put together and I can provide, which is a bit of a cheat sheet on these calculations uh, for anybody that may be interested also. And uh, the calculations for the bladder pump also apply to the QED should be mentioned as well. So for calculating our PSI, for the bladder pump, this can be both, uh, as I said, for the 407 or the QED, uh, we calculate based on where the screen intake is, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, but I want to place my pump somewhere in the middle of the screen. Um, and we use our calculation, which is actually taken from Solace, where they say that one PSI can lift about 2.3 foot of water. 
So I take my depth in meters and I can, there's a couple of ways you can do this calculation, but uh, for, so I times that by 3.3 to convert that to feet. I then divide that by that 2.3. So the 2.3 foot of water per PSI. And then I add plus 10 to account for what they call line loss. So you will get some bleed from your tubing and your connections and your pumps and that sort of thing. So this plus 10 PSI does account for that. Um, and conversely with the 408 double valve pump, it's the same calculation, but we're working this out again, just at the standing water level initially and not from the pump intake. You can do this at the pump intake for the double valve pump if you wish to increase your, you know, get that sort of low flow purging um, levels happening. Um, but generally for our, in the case of our low flow sampling, we're just calculating at the standing water level initially. And these PSI calcs are um, a good starting point to come at with whatever bore you're coming up. So I take a look at my bore logs. I have my screened interval. I've got my meterage of where I want to sit my pump. Once I have that, I'll be able to use these calculation to see how much PSI I'm going to need prior to even going out in the field. Um, so for the drive time, you can apply in the 407 bladder pumps and for the QED bladder pumps. You can apply manually your air or gas uh, to the pump and uh, you can place your sample line at the top of your bore into a submerged bucket of water. When you apply your drive gas, you should see bubbles being expelled from this sample line, which indicates to me that the bladder is being compressed and the air in the water is traveling up that sample line. So when the bubbles stop, that indicates to me that that bladder is fully compressed and we want about 80% of that time as a good starting point for a drive cycle. So 100% of that time means that the bladder is being fully compressed all the way down. There's no more. It's only a set volume of water in that bladder. So we won't see you know, any more coming out until we do another drive and then a, another vent and then our next drive cycle. So about 80% of that time, that's where that calculation comes from. 408 is a little bit trickier and a little bit harder to get your head around, but uh, you can place the pump initially. You can time your manually applied gas the same as with your 407s or your QEDs, whatever bladder pump. Um, and effectively, we want to wait until our sample line expels all the water from the drive line because, again, it comes back up to standing water level in that, in that drive line all the way down through the pump and up through the sample line where you'll get an expulsion of your compressed air or compressed gas. And this is, happens initially when you, pay, when you place the pump. So... Again, if you're worried about your air contact with your water, just remembering before we even take our water samples, we are uh, ensuring that we're purging uh, enough water to get our equilibrium in our parameters to come through. So hopefully that, you know, that process will avoid that. So uh, if we consider that time that we've, that we've timed to get all that water from the drive line through the pump up the sample line to be 100% of the time, we want about 40% of that time will be a, a good starting point for a drive cycle. Now, that is a bit tricky to consider, but basically if you cut the, the pump in half, essentially, you have 50% of time on each side. So, if, and, you know, we want to avoid that air contact with water. So we're saying 40% of that time will allow the air to go down the drive line. And then when we have it, we reach a vent cycle and it'll come back up to equilibrium. Uh, and back to the standing water level and then repeat that process again. So if done correctly, you won't have air contact with your sample water, um, but these calculations can be a bit of a guide for you and I can talk more in depth about that uh, if you have more uh, questions regarding that. We're cal uh, calculating our vent times. Um, we say that uh, it's definitely based on your bore and your hydraulic conductivity and your recovery and your drawdown when you're doing these samples. So as a basic principle, I always say at least twice to three times your drive time, because again, when we're driving, that's when we're drawing water from, from the uh, aquifer uh, and that vent time allows that water to recover. So that's where we're, we're closely monitoring our drawdown level with our water level meter. And the vent just allow, is just our re bore recovery time. So we want to have a good amount of time for that bore to recover. And you can adjust that 
to be increased more. To, and it might it might need more recovery if it's a slow recharging bore, or it might need less if it's a uh, you know, rapidly recharging bore. So once you calculate your PSI, once you calculate your drive times, and you give it a vent time of least twice, then there's the some basic starting points for when you come across to any bore really. Um, the maximum depth ranges are uh, situated there, and then your drive and sample lines. Probably just one quick thing to mention is that on the QED and the 407 bladder pump, you have a quarter inch with our twin bonded tubing. Your quarter inch is the air, the 3 8 is the sample. The only difference is in the 408 out of the box, the 3 8 is the air, and the quarter is the sample. This can be changed, and we always recommend to change over, and it's a quick process just to change those fittings around. Um, uh, you're using less PSI pressures with a smaller diameter tubing in that quarter inch. And so I always swap those connections over, but that's just something to consider if you do have double valve pumps or are looking at those for future projects. So uh, by utilizing those basic calculations that I said, it provides us with more details prior to the sampling to ensure that we have the right tools for the job. So. If I look at my bore logs and I can do my PSI calculations based on what pump I'm using prior to even going out, I can ensure that my uh, controllers, my compressors, my regulators are going to be enough for the job to occur. So in the case of the silence controller, if I take a look at my bore logs and I'm on the cusp of my 120 PSI range, you know, I may want to consider going to that 250 PSI range just to give myself a bit of a buffer if the site is quite remote and I just want to ensure that uh, for whatever reason, if I'm not getting a bit of a sample, I might need to bump up my PSI a bit more, um, but my pre-calculations are right on that cusp. That's the things to consider there. Um, so those calculations give you a bit more of an insight before you even get out to site, what you might need in terms of the gear to spec in you know, able to do your low flow sampling. So, uh, the compressed air, I've used the example here of the 12 volt compressor from, from Solenced, uh, but it's a very viable and portable option. Um, more shallower applications, I would say the, com the compressor uh, is, is better to utilize. So I generally say if you have bores that are greater than about 40 meters and you have quite a few of them, uh, just some things to consider in terms of a compressor is the operation of it. So the operation of the compressor is that it's trying to maintain a constant pressure with inside the chamber of the compressor. So if you have quite deep bores and you're using quite high PSIs with quite multiple bores, uh, there's a chance that you, know, you might burn out those compressors, whichever one it may be. Um, so if you're on a remote site and you're wanting to utilize a compressor, that's just something to keep in mind that you might want to consider having a backup there of some compressed gas and a regulator. Um, prior to going out to site, but that's just something to consider there. Uh, in the case of the compressed gas, uh, we generally utilize CO2, uh, but nitrogen is also uh, an option. Uh, sometimes uh, CO2 might not be viable for some VOCs that are of concern uh, on a site. Um, if you're worried about that, uh, you know, gas contact with your sample water. So some people might typically shift to a nitrogen and generally, uh, you will find that if you're sampling quite deep, nitrogen may be your, your gas of choice because we tend to get uh, a few uh, slightly higher PSI ranges um, with nitrogen gas and regulators. Um, it also can be tricky to make sure that your regulators for these are also capable of handling enough PSI pressures, and they're often difficult to find. Um, but if you are struggling with that, I can certainly assist if, uh, you know, if you're struggling to find a regulator that can, is fit for purpose. Uh, I'll just breeze quickly over these uh, other options that Rich has already spoke about, the parasolic pumps, just a couple of things. Um, on paper, 10 metres um, based on sea level because it's a vacuum pump. Uh, I generally find that, you know, six to seven metres lift is about, you know, where you start to get it a, a, more of a trickle. So uh, just consider that sometimes whilst it's on paper that it says 10 metres, uh, generally we're never going to be directly level, you know, you know, on sea level or below sea level. So uh, just keep that in mind there. Um, they are reversible with those controllers. So, you know, for shallow bore development, like those little piezos uh, that, um, that Richard mentioned earlier, uh, that is a little nifty thing 
uh, to to keep in mind and you know great portability for for a site too when access might be quite difficult so you're taking your your portable uh, piezometers and your peristaltic pump and you can get some samples that way uh, i mentioned earlier the 12 volt uh, submersible pumps as i said uh, they are small diameter options in 12 volt. Uh, you can achieve good depths with them. So, you know, something like a stainless steel monsoon can give you about 50 meters of lift. Uh, the low flow controller gives you that control to be able to still do a low flow sample. Um, but some considerations for this is that uh, there is a high potential uh, for burnout if left running continuously. Um, I generally find more than an hour, two hours, uh, there can be some problems with those. Uh, they Highly turbid water can be problematic for these pumps as well. So if you know prior to going outside that you have quite a high uh, turbidity in your in your water, um, that might be something to consider if you're already looking at the 12 volt submersible pumps. Um, but they are economically viable for for a short sampling round. So there's just some things to keep in mind with the submersible pumps there. And just quickly mention, I guess, uh, the foot valves. Um, whilst the principle of these might not necessarily be low flow and the definition of these guys uh, are based on the diameter of the foot valve um, correlating to whether it's a standard or a high or a low flow. Uh, it's just something to keep in mind if you have a very tricky scenario where you have very small diameters or uh, a bore that might be uh, semi-blocked and we can't get anything else down there. Um, to get a sample, uh, foot valves might be something that you could consider and there are sort of mechanical actuators with those um, that uh, you, know, you could utilise with those foot valves. Is it necessarily a low flow sample? Well, point of contention, but are you getting a sample with it? Uh, if, you know, in those tricky scenarios, just something to keep in mind there with that. Um, and finally, I'll just uh, brief over, I suppose, some frequently asked questions uh, before we get into um, any questions that you guys might have. Um, so some touch points I've already spoken about here, um, but the frequently asked questions that I uh, get almost on the daily uh, would be, when would I use a QED versus a 407 bladder pump. Well, you have those uh, depth restrictions that I spoke about before uh, with those. That's probably the main uh, one. You also have um, your uh, timing in terms of your bladder changes uh, with the 407 bladder pump. They can be a little bit longer uh, than the QED sample pro. So you might want to weigh up those considerations. Um, but generally, if you have depth, greater depths in the QE, uh, than the QED can handle, uh, but you still want to go for that bladder pump option, then uh, the 407 might be uh, something to consider there. Um, I did touch on bottled gas uh, versus compressor air uh, previously in that slide, um, but again, uh, you know, your bottled gas, you're going to get higher PSI pressures than your compressors. Uh, you, you, your compressors have a bit, you know, potential to burn out if you have high utilisation on those. And you're also limited to your PSI ranges with your compressors. Um, you can use, uh, you know, uh, higher spec compressors for sure. Uh, it doesn't really matter what what compressor you do use. You can change your fittings in those compressors to directly connect to any uh, controller you have, um, but just to consider that uh, you know if you're operating these, uh, you know, with uh, multiple bores at quite deep depths, that's uh, something that can happen. Um, what if I've got a, a less than 50 mil bore? Well, there are quite a few options for this. Um, those 407s and 408 pumps that I spoke about uh, can be in a lot uh, smaller diameters than your general 1.66 inch. So there is a 5 8 inch uh, double valve pump. There is a one inch bladder pump. There's those foot valves that I spoke about to give you a sample. Um, there's a lot of different ways uh, to, to obtain uh, a sample when you have uh, a, a lot less than 50 mil diameter bore. Um, the 408 and 407 I did touch on previously, uh, PFAS sampling, are there options? 
Yes, it is tricky, as we probably uh, all know. Uh, it is quite a point of contention coming in, um, in Australia, certainly. Um, some things that I would consider when you have a site that is potentially uh, PFAS contaminated, and that is an area of concern uh, from the client, are your materials when going to do the sampling. Uh, obviously, we know yeah, HDPE over LDPE needs to happen. Uh, anything that you can change for stainless steel, for example, in some of these pumps, uh, generally, they're Teflon balls, but we can have stainless steel check balls uh, implemented in. And also to consider your statements from your suppliers. Sometimes your statements from your suppliers in terms of the PFAS side of things, they are happy to provide, but the statement will generally always say that there is uh, no known PFAS, with known being the key word there. Um, that's something that people can give, uh, and that's fine because it's, you know, they're never going to sort of state unless there is laboratory testing that there is no PFAS in the equipment that we provide. Sometimes that's okay for an order, sometimes that's not. Um, so there is, there is some more options around the PFAS stuff that uh, I'm happy to deal with. There's also considerations with your decontamination. For example, Decon 90 is not... Uh, suitable for PFAS when decontamination, you need something like uh, a Liquinox or something like that. That is uh, okay to decon uh, to decon your your equipment. Um, but happy to discuss this if anyone else is looking at uh, a site that might be PFAS contaminated, and happy to provide some guidance on that after this. Um, the low flow versus purging method is something I get asked about quite a lot. Um, you know, the purging method where we take our three bore volumes um, might take a bit more time uh, than our low flow sampling. We also have to consider is the site uh, maybe a bit sensitive on where we, um, you know, uh, expel that, that purge water from. Uh, if we over, if we over pump, uh, we're starting to draw down past that screen into the sump level, which we get increased turbidity uh, coming through that might affect our overall water quality for our for our metals uh, for that sort of thing. So, but you know, a purging method might be the method of choice. Both are acceptable uh, in in the guidelines. So, you know, low flow is our preferred method, uh, but certainly uh, it's not to discredit purging method at all. Um, there's a lot more depth and detail that we can go into uh, after the fact, but uh, that is a question I get asked quite a lot. And uh, we did we did cover uh, a lot of things that uh, Richard spoke about in terms of sampling quite deep, some things to consider. Um, just an overview of that was uh, your HDPE tubing uh, as opposed to your <coughs> posterior LDPE tubing. Oh, apologies. Um, and also your, your depth uh, and weight uh, on the pumps um, where you get a buoyancy issue uh, past your sort of 300, 350 metre mark. Um, you need some significant weight on the end of your your pumps. And um, there's just some things that we can speak about uh, if, if sampling from uh, deep uh, is something that you're looking into. Um, we've certainly done a lot of that. Um, so happy to provide uh, any guidance through to you uh, if need be. Um, but I think that's enough from me. Um, Thank you all. Uh, I will uh, take just a little bit of time now. Uh, we have gone a little bit over, so apologies for people, uh, but thanks for sticking around. Um, and we'll filter some, some questions that you might have. Um, uh, so if you uh, want to take this time to uh, share any questions that you might have, uh, we can maybe answer a couple, um, but uh, if you push for time, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to answer. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks for attending. The average lifespan of the QED pump, Julie. Uh, it's a tricky one. It also depends on your utilization of that pump and where you're utilizing it. Um, they tend to, you know, we have quite a large fleet. Uh, in our rental fleet, um, 
of the QED pumps and they last for quite a long time. Uh, the lifespan of it is definitely a sort of a gray area there where we're looking about, you know, where have you utilized, have you used, have you utilized in highly turbid areas? Have you, have you used it in aggressive mediums? Um, that type of thing. But um, certainly it's a, it's a highly reliable pump that has quite a, you know, a long, a long life if, if cared for properly, definitely. Uh, and nursery, uh, yes, we can uh, provide you the copy of those slides, no problem at all. Waters of EC, oh, is this regards to the QED pump in waters of EC? Uh, yes, yeah, that's that seems that's okay. That's generally generally okay. Um, it's about uh, half of half of seawater, so. Um, you know, the 316 stainless, uh, that, that's okay to um, to be utilised for pumping. I would just, you know, a clean, a good cleaning process after the fact, uh, if you're doing man, if you're doing portable sampling, uh, would be key there and a good decon of everything after you do it. Um, but, yeah, I've done so in, in higher EC ranges um, from a portable system. Um, your aggressive or well, your mediums are also important to consider prior to you wanting to dedicate um, systems uh, as well. So it's important to take a look over to those if dedication to pumps is something you might be looking at because um, that's when obviously you have the pumps being constantly in that water. Uh, what are some, you know, some, some high EC, uh, that type of thing, just some things to look at. But we're happy to, uh, to provide you guidance on that if that's something you're interested in. Okay, just checking both avenues of the questions here. Thanks, Liam. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Graham. No problems at all. Look, uh, we've um, taken up, uh, oh, hang on, sorry, Julie's suppliers mentioned plastic tubing for QED pump is once off use it seems wasteful can you recommend if tubing can be used more than once yeah that's a, also a, a common question that i get julie and that is uh is tubing able to be reused um it is able to be if decontaminated properly and can you guarantee that you're decontaminating that prior before you go to each and every bore the way that you would have to decontaminate that is to you know have a have a drum of water that's decon and have that that pump running through the cycle of the entirety of that tubing um to be able to effectively decontaminate prior to going to each and every site so whilst it may seem wasteful there's also timed considerations with this um, in terms of reusing tubing, um, but a th yeah, something to keep in mind in terms of the wastefulness is that we often try to go with biodegradable tubing and that's an important process for us as well to have. Uh, we generally don't go with uh, anything else that's not biodegradable, um, just as a bit of an offset for that wastefulness on the tubing. Um, so, there's a way up there in terms of your time investment to decontaminate that tubing. If you wish to do, you know, the, the sampling process as per the guidelines as best you can um, with, with how much tubing you're using and, and uh, are you decontaminating it properly? You know, so that's probably some, some things for you to consider there in terms of, in terms of reusing tubing. Me personally, I, I wouldn't. Um, I just think, a setup that you have to take to properly decontaminate to run a cycle of water, um, you know, all the way through with decon with decon through the entirety of the tubing. If you have quite a deep bore, you might that might be quite a long length. Um, might outweigh the the cost of the of the tubing. And if we go with biodegradable, that's less, you know, I suppose less for our conscience on that. So um, hopefully that answers your question there, Julie. Um, Thanks, Santo, on, on joining us. I'm uh, glad you can make it. Um, so if there's no other questions there, uh, our contact details uh, are there for uh, myself and Richard. 
um, thanks, thanks heaps, Richard, for for joining me today on this and providing uh, your your knowledge on the theory associated with the low flow sampling. And um, obviously, if there's any other questions or any other discussions you may wish to have, please feel free to reach out to us uh, by either by email or the uh, the phone number below. But um, thank you all. Uh, have a good rest of your day, and uh, hopefully, talk to you soon. Thank you.